Uh, so to start up, out, we have, uh, this is the Remote Recreational Cabin Site Staking Program. This was started based on some legislation in the late 90s. It differs quite a bit from our old homesteading and home staking programs. Uh, the, the first offering for this program was in 2001. Um, some of the unique changes that we've had for this one is that um, specifically the, the old homestead home staking programs had certain post patent restrictions, uh, some with regard to the time at which you could subdivide or, or sell the parcel after you receive patent to it. Um, and more specifically, a lot of those had prove up requirements. So you had to occupy, you had to uh, construct a dwelling within a certain period of time and occupy it within a certain period of time in order to receive title to it. This program does not have those, those requirements. Um, additionally, with those programs, uh, generally they require that the individual go out and contract for their own survey. So they had to go out and select their own surveyor and, and uh, go into contract with them. The problem with this is that for, uh, for an, a surveyor to go out and survey a single parcel out and off in remote locations, it was very expensive to do so. And so it was prohibitive for a lot of folks to be able to participate in that program. Um, additionally, in some cases that uh, folks would go out and they'd select a, a surveyor and they had difficulty getting a surveyor to perform it, to actually uh, survey it and, and plot the parcel. So in this program, the, uh, <clears throat> the Department of Natural Resources contracts for the survey of those parcels. And so we, uh, we roll all the parcels from each staking area in together. We go up to contract on all those parcels all at once and with the, the increased number of parcels, it significantly decreases the survey cost. Additionally, since the Department of Natural Resources is administering the contract, uh, that makes it to where we can ensure that the contract actually does get completed in a timely manner. Um, so the, once everything is surveyed and appraised, uh, they are, the parcels are sold at fair market value for the, the surface estate of um, the parcel. Um, so as you're all aware, uh, having already gone through the lottery process, uh, authorizations to stake a parcel are awarded to, um, to winners based on uh, a lottery. Uh, so if we have more applicants for an area, then we have authorization to go to a lottery to determine who gets the stake. So um, a little bit about the process, which we'll cover a little bit more in, de yeah, in detail. Once you stake your parcel, you lease the parcel for three years while DNR contracts out for the, the survey of that parcel. Once the survey is completed, we're going to appraise it and have the opportunity to purchase it at the fair market value minus what you already put in towards the survey deposit at that time. For other information, the Public Information Center, uh, located up here on the 12th floor uh, of the Atwood Building, is, uh, is a great source of information. Uh, they can help you out with uh, land status information. Uh, they can help you uh, look at aerial imagery, print out maps, that sort of thing. So I highly encourage you, if you haven't done so, uh, you can head up there and uh, get access to those resources. Uh, they also have uh, public computers up there that you can do, use for uh, doing land research and such. Uh, they are available from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., uh, Monday through Friday, and uh, there's also a public information center up in the uh, Fairbanks uh, DNR office if you happen to be up in that way. Um, the Remote Recreational Cabin Site staff, uh, we have located both again here in, in Anchorage and also in Fairbanks, and page six has uh, access to our contact information there. Uh, if you choose to reach us by email, uh, we're at the dnr.rcs at alaska.gov, um, and that goes out to our, our team so we can get you a, a response in a timely manner. Um, and then we also have, in your staking instructions, there's a lot of links to some very useful resources, which we'll point out here. So um, the Department of Natural Resources webpage, which we're about to cover here, um, has links to uh, a lot of different sources that are going to help you go out planning out your parcel, and then also going back and looking at this after you've you know, been in the process or you're through the process. Um, so specifically, the, uh, we're going to go over how to look up the updated staking maps. Uh, additionally, before you go out in the field, I'd highly encourage you to look at that and also do some land status research as well. Uh, we also have the ability to receive online payments via our website. Um, so I would assume that most folks have probably been through our, uh, to our land sales webpage already uh, through the, the lottery process here, but the, the situation has changed a little bit since you started here. So since this is a 2014 offering, the offering itself has already been completed. We're now in the staking process. Uh, the location of it's changed just a little bit. Uh, you'd still go to the, uh, this is the landsales.alaska.gov webpage. Uh, and if you click on the remote recreational cabin sites link, uh, the information is now going to be contained under the past offerings link. So if you click on the past offerings link, there's going to be a lot of information that's going to be helpful to you here right now when you're going out and planning to stake a parcel and then also uh, in the future afterwards. Uh, to begin with, there's a link uh, under, under past offerings. There's several different links there. There's a link to the brochure, which has uh, the, the original offering brochure along with uh, any rod or updated information. 
Uh, we also have a uh, link to the, uh, the base appraisal reports. And uh, the most important bit is these staking areas that are uh, the links to the individual staking areas. Um, so as you know, there's the, the link for each staking area name um, has the updated staking map information, which is gonna be useful when you're either going out to plan out where you're gonna stake, or once you've already submitted the lease application, uh, that'll have, uh, you can go back there and look and see what your, uh, what your parcel looks like. Once the parcels are, uh, are staked, or once you give us your application, we'll cover in a little bit of detail about how we handle that, uh, but we'll receive your application, we adjudicate it, uh, we get the, uh, the information of your, the location of your parcel, and then we will plot that location on the map up here. So as you see here in the, you know, the red lines uh, with the ADL numbers on there. Uh, so you can look at your parcel um, afterwards. And uh, so you can pull up that staking map, look at your parcel, and um, see just how it, how it lays out in relation to, to other ones. Um, in addition to that, uh, if you're planning on going out in the field later in the staking area, you can look and see what's already out there. So that'll kind of help you do it a little bit of planning. Um, of note, the ADL number that you see uh, associated with those individual parcels is an Alaska Division of Lands number. It's just it's a serial number uh, that we assign to uh, any case files for the Department of Natural Resources. So, uh, <clears throat> thank you. All right, so uh, we're going to go through all this information in a little bit more detail, but just to, to kind of summarize what we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to go over uh, the information individually with the interstaking packet, uh, and uh, we're going to uh, go through all those resources to make sure you understand what they are and how to use them. Um, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on some of them to make sure to highlight a couple points uh, specifically. So um, in general, before you go out in the field, uh, you want to familiarize yourself with the, the information in your staking packet. Uh, read the staking instructions uh, thoroughly so you understand those. Research the area and then collect your materials for staking. Uh, then once you go out in the field, you're going to select your site, uh, get your reference point, you're going to uh, you're gonna well, walk through the parcel so you know what, uh, what precisely you're staking. Get the corner post in, brush and flag your lines, uh, collect all the data for your parcel, and then uh, measure that and take a lot of photographs. Uh, once you get back in from the field, you submit the lease application um, and then uh, and apply for the, uh, for the actual lease. And then uh, you'll lease your parcel for three years while we do the survey and appraisal on that parcel. Um, and at the end of the appraisal process, you have the opportunity to purchase that parcel. And so we're gonna cover that in detail. So, to begin with, before you go out in the field, um, everybody should have a, a staking packet in front of them. Um, and so, if you'd like to, um, I highly encourage you to go along through your staking packet and uh, go through these as we're, as we're discussing. So, uh, this lists all the contents of your staking packet. And we're gonna go through this in, in a bit of detail right here. Um, so, if there's something that we're discussing here that you don't have in your staking packet, let us know. I uh, will make sure that you get a copy of that so you have to complete the staking packet. Uh, so to begin with, we're gonna start with the authorization letter, the award letter. Um, so uh, this letter is what gives you the authorization to go out and stake a parcel in the field. Um, so uh, I would highly recommend that you take a copy uh, or make a copy of this and bring a copy of this uh, authorization letter with you out in the field. Likewise, if you're gonna be having an authorized agent stake for you, I would recommend that you give a copy of this to your authorized agent. Um, such that if we're out in the field and we, you know, we're contacting folks as they're in the process of staking, we, you know, we may ask for your authorization letter and then we can say, yep, I have, this is who I am and I've got your authorization here, or I'm staking for this person. Uh, so please make a copy of that and bring it with you. The, uh, the staking instructions is probably one of the most important part, portions of your staking packet. Um, again, I highly recommend that you make a copy or two of these. Uh, specifically, you're gonna wanna make sure to bring a copy of this with you into the field. This is very important. Uh, there's a lot of conditions on staking a parcel, and to make sure that you're fulfilling those conditions, uh, you need to have the reference available to you. Uh, so again, page six has contact information about how to get a hold of us. Um, this also has a link to a lot of additional resources for doing the research before you go out into the field. But we have all the requirements of how to stake a parcel, all the rules and restrictions that are associated with that. Uh, we have examples. We have uh, examples of sketch plats and how to information directions on how to fill out your sketch plat. We have a lot of neat tools for, uh, uh, for calculations and such. And this outlines the, uh, the process about well, filling in the lease application and what you have to do during the lease period. Uh, so the supplemental staking instructions are gonna be area specific. Um, so this has all of the specific uh, restrictions that are associated with that specific area for, in which you're staking. So this has the uh, reserved areas, the setbacks from uh, either anatomous streams or uh, water bodies. 
Um, so it has the uh, uh, has any specific restrictions to that area. Um, additionally, this will list any public water bodies that we've already identified in the field right now. There may be some out there that we've not identified, but we'll, we'll cover those in a little bit more detail later. Um, this has any updated information. This also has base appraisal information, which um, is carried over from the uh, from the offering brochure, which will help you identify how much parcel in that area is likely to cost you. And it also has uh, the information about the survey deposit, so how much that, uh, how much you will be paying for a survey deposit during the lease period. That's specific to each area as well. Uh, the checklist. I would highly recommend that you make a copy of this checklist, uh, that you review it before you go out in the field so you have a, an idea of what the expectation is that you're going to need to collect before you go out in the field, what you're going to be doing while you're out in the field, and then you can, you'll be able to use this uh, while you are uh, collecting materials for staking, while you're out in the field actually doing the process, and then subsequently uh, preparing a lease application to, to submit. Uh, so this is very important and I highly recommend you make copies of that as well. Uh, the, the staking map, yeah, everybody should have in your staking packet, a large format staking map. Um, this, had, this is the, the, the map for the staking area. It's based uh, with the USGS topographical map uh, as the, uh, the base layer for that. It has uh, private property on there. It shows public water bodies on there, access. It has a, uh, all of the very generalized uh, information for the staking area. Uh, of specific uh, note, there is a, a note section down in the lower left hand uh, corner of, of this that gives to some of the general uh, information about the staking area as well uh, with regard to some of those restrictions. Um, as noted uh, on the uh, the website that uh, the three just pulled up, we do have uh, the updated staking maps uh, available on there. So um, as the staking period progresses, as we get applications in there, we'll start updating those staking maps. So I encourage you that before you actually go out in the field, you know, pull that up, take a look at it, see if anything's changed or if there's any additional parcels or anything out there. So, uh, the boundary coordinate diagram, uh, this will be a little smaller format map. This has uh, coordinates for the, the boundary of the staking area as uh, one of the requirements of the, uh, of the program is that you stake within the boundary. Uh, this will give you coordinates so you can locate within uh, where that boundary is. It also lists out uh, reserved areas within the staking area and uh, coordinates for that so you can adequately locate that you're, you're staking in an area available to staking. Um, if you are going to be using a GPS uh, when you're out there in the field, the, of specific note, there is uh, the coordinates that are provided on here are going to be in WGS84 in uh, degrees, minutes, seconds. And we'll cover that a little bit um, in a little bit more detail about using a GPS, but it's important to note uh, present. Uh, the survey key lists all the private property within the staking area boundary, um, and it shows the private property and it shows the associated survey number for that. So if you're staking in an area that has private property in there, you're going to need to familiarize yourself with, first off, what private property is going to be in that area, identify what survey that's going to be on, and then by going to the, uh, to the, uh, the website, the, uh, the remote recreational cabinet site's website, under each one of those areas, it lists out the individual surveys uh, for, or the, the individual plats for each of those surveys. Um, so if you click on that, uh, on that link there, it'll show you where the coordinates are, any easements or reservations, restrictions, and such that are associated with that parcel. Um, so, of specific note, uh, Alaska State Land Survey parcels typically have a 25 or 30 foot easement along parcel boundaries, for instance. So those are for public access and utility easement purposes. So you could potentially use that for access to get to the land beyond that. Uh, there's some restrictions that, that, uh, that we'll cover uh, with that, specifically that it's sensitive private property they have some say in how that access uh, or what happens with that. For instance, they have their, their trees, so they get to make determinations as to the disposition of those trees. You have to cut them down uh, to get access. Uh, U.S. survey parcels do not have uh, easements. So this will familiar, famili help familiarize yourself with those individual private properties, the restrictions on their reservations, that sort of thing. And all the links are available via that website. Uh, the, uh, additionally, the, uh, these show the monument locations uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the staking areas. So if you notice these little Celtic cross uh, looking areas, those are going to be the, uh, uh, the BLM monuments uh, within the area. The ones that look like kind of the BMW symbol, those are going to be state monuments. And we'll, we'll cover those when we uh, discuss uh, reference points as well. Um, but this will show you the, the key uh, coordinates and points of interest in there. 
uh, the lease application. We're going to go through this in a good bit more detail. Yes. All right. So. Uh, Specific to the lease application, there's a lot of information on page eight about uh, describing the lease application, uh, page eight of your survey instructions. Uh, that will give you some information on the lease application, how to fill it out, um, as well as uh, so page 21 to 34 uh, is specifically the information how to fill it out. Page eight is the photograph information. Uh, and we're going to go through this in detail when we go into specifically how to stake your parcel because you need to know how you're going to be putting the information um, on this form as well. Uh, so included within your staking pack is a brochure with uh, uh, the erratas. We had uh, one errata this year. Uh, this contains all the general uh, conditions and such. As so there is a digital copy on the on the website here, um, and a lot of the information that's contained in the brochure has been carried over. Uh, specifically, the brochure does have all that general area description information that may be of use to you as well. And we'll be pointing back to this later in the presentation for some information as a resource for. Uh, how to purchase your parcel and such. Uh, the staking packet has a general overview uh, flow chart uh, for the uh, for the staking process, kind of walks you through the process from start to finish. Uh, so kind of all in one step. Um, and then uh, there's a couple of fact sheets in there. So I'm going to spend um, a few minutes on this generally allowed to use this fact sheet because this is going to be very important uh, during the staking process and then specifically after you have the parcel. Um, so generally allowed uses, uh, the fact sheet, this fact sheet describes specifically what is an allowable use on state land without a permit. Um, so for instance, um, of these, you can cut a trail up to five feet wide using hand tools. Uh, that includes a chainsaw. So when you're out in the field staking, you're going to be brushing a flag in a line. Um, that all falls under generally allowed uses. With, and we're going to bring up an exception to that when it comes to pre-staking. Uh, so you can brush and flag lines out there on a state plan. So you can cut a trail to your parcel or to the area you intend to stake your parcel. You don't need to get a permit. That's all perfectly allowable. Uh, you can use timber resources. Uh, however, that is exclusive to using dead and down material on site, uh, or so dead and down wood. So you can collect, you know, whatever the uh, dead wood, you know, down wood use it on site for cooking a warming fire. However, you cannot collect from state land dead and down wood, bring it back to your house, put in your wood stove to heat your home. It has to be used specifically on site. Um, if you're looking to get uh, to harvest uh, timber or firewood from state land, you can get a permit to do so through our Division of Forestry. Um, and they, they may have specific conditions on that depending on the area in which you're looking for the permit. Uh, but by generally allowed uses, you can use dead and down wood on site. Uh, camping, hunting, fishing is all generally allowed use on state land. Um, however, you can only camp on state land for up to 14 days, after which you have to move two miles away before you can come back and reoccupy the site. Um, so that is a specific note that uh, when you stake your parcel, so you can go out there, you can camp on the site, you can use it as you would any general state land. Uh, even after you turn your lease application, it's not actually going to be into a lease until after the staking period ends, you know, whatever. So. Uh, sometime in, in September, October, we'll be releasing those. We'll be approving the leases and issuing the lease. Um, up until that point, it is still state land. Um, so all of the generally allowed uses apply. So you can camp on there up to 14 days. Uh, likewise, other folks can camp on there up to 14 days. Uh, you can't store materials on there for more than 14 days any of that. So all these restrictions still apply up until the point you're going to be under a lease. So that's an important thing. Um, so you, you may. Uh, use an off-road vehicle up to 1,500 pounds across state land without a permit. So, I mean, your typical ATV is allowable, and that's on or off of an established easement. However, there are conditions to that. Um, so, if uh, you, you can use a yeah off-road vehicle up to 1,500 pounds on or off an easement, provided that is not you know causing uh, you know rutting or damaging the vegetative mat, you can also use a highway vehicle up to 15,000 pounds across state land without a permit, with the same conditions. So, you can't be damaging the vegetative mat. So. Uh, within the staking areas, you can cut a trail, or if you don't even need to cut a trail, you can use an ATV to access within the staking area. However, it is unlawful to go out and tear up the vegetative mat to cause destruction uh, you know, to the, basically to the surface, anyway, to the soils and such. Any questions on any of that? All right, we're going to be covering, we're going to be uh, touching base on this periodically throughout the presentation as well. Uh, the other fact sheet that you have within there is the, re is the remote recreational cabin sites and the appraisal process. This walks over the, uh, the appraisal process and how uh, specifically we apply the base appraisal, which has already uh, been completed for each of these areas, uh, how we apply the base appraisal to your individual parcel. And so this will cover that in a bit more detail. Uh, <clears throat> the FireWise uh, information booklet has a great amount of information about how to defend your home, your parcel, your investment from wildfire. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to touch base on this a little bit because this is going to be very important for 
identifying an area that you want to stake a parcel. So um, in some of these areas, there's a lot of black spruce, I mean, there may be some slope, there may be specific fire hazardous conditions. Um, and as such, by, by reviewing the information they have in that FireWise booklet, that can help you to identify an area that is more defensible from a wildfire, because if they're part of the natural landscape, and many of these areas are gonna come through on some, you know, on some level, some degree. So uh, by reviewing this information, you can identify areas that are, first off, at less risk from a uh, wildfire area, so those areas that are in hardwood stands, those areas with uh, reduced slope, that sort of thing. It also makes some very good recommendations <coughs> about how you can defend a structure from wildfire. So after you've gone out and staked your parcel, you have patented your parcel, you, you've you know, uh, built a, a cabin or something out there. Uh, it gives clearing requirement or clearing, suggested clearing distances. It gives uh, information about impounding water and certain ways that you can protect that structure from wildfire should a wildfire come through. Of specific note, many of the areas that, uh, that we're offering this year are within a limited fire management option. What that means is that that area has a very limited priority for initial attack. So if a fire comes through the area, the Department of Forestry or the Alaska Forest or Fire Service, the BLM, is likely not going to prioritize that, especially if there's other fires in higher levels or higher management options uh, that are going on. So they may not be able to go get right out there to protect it. So the more work that you can do may, may protect your investment a bit more. Additionally, even if fire crews are out there and you have an area that is not defensible, so I mean if there's black spruce going right up to your cabin, it can be very hazardous for them to even go in there and try to defend that structure. And as such, the more work that you do in advance, the more likelihood that they will be able to go out there and to attempt to protect that. So, uh, so adhering to the FireWise principles and, and research in this should help you out a lot in well, selecting an area to state and protecting your investment. So I highly recommend they, they read that information before you go out to state to help the plan. Uh, so the photo release form uh, gives us authorization to use the, the photos that you provide us as part of your release application uh, to use in the future for things such as the brochure, uh, for this, uh, the staking uh, workshop and such. It's a great opportunity for us when we have uh, you know, photos of people actually going out and doing this in the field. So um, that's where a lot of this comes from. The more help we can get from you guys, we appreciate it. If you're willing to let us use your photos, please, please turn in this. Uh, the, the release authorization, basically the release application. Uh, there is a credit card uh, form in there. Uh, if you're going to be submitting your uh, your release application by mail, you can um, include this in there. We'll run your credit card information for your uh, your lease fee and then your release application fee. We'll just shred it when we're done, so we don't retain the information. Uh, the relinquishment postcard is very important. Yeah, ultimately, if uh, if you decide that you are not interested in staking a parcel, if it's uh, you know, too much work, you decide that the area is not quite right for you, uh, please submit this to us in a timely manner. Um, as as noted, there's a couple alternates in this room. Uh, the more folks that that submit this, the more opportunity we have to give that authorization to other folks that may want to stake that parcel. Um, if you do lose your relinquishment postcard, that's fine. You can either contact us, we'll give you another one, or you can just let us know that you'd like to relinquish your parcel. However, we are going to need to get that either an email or a writing so that it's, uh, so we can ensure that it's actually you've given it to us. Um, but the sooner you can get this to us, the better. Uh, if you turn it in the last 15 days of the staking period, it's not going to do anybody really any good. So if you decide not to stake, please get this in to us. 